All right, everybody. Good evening. I hope y'all are all doing well this evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover this evening, um, but we're going to do it. We're going to get through it relatively quickly, um, so we're going to get going. Uh, what I have decided that's probably just going to be the most easiest way to cover this material tonight, I'm going to go through the slides, and then I'm going to come back, pull up the contract, and write out a contract. I think that would just be the easiest way. Okay? Now you're thinking right. So, that's what we're going to end up doing tonight. All right? Okay. So, we're going to start with talking about closing possession and more. Is what we're going to be covering this evening. So our learning objectives this evening is we're going to describe the provisions of the closing and possession paragraphs, uh, which is going to be paragraphs 9 and 10. Uh, we're also going to describe the proper use of the buyer's and seller's temporary residential lease agreement and the importance of what's called a holdover fee uh, that's going to be in paragraph 19 of those agreements. We're also going to discuss what may and may not be included in the special provisions paragraph of the one to four family residential resale contract. We'll also fill out paragraph 12 of the settlement and other expenses of the one to four family residential resale contract. And again, identify the provisions within. We'll also identify the paragraphs in regards to um, the paragraphs in the one to four family contract and we also do not need to be filled out and just describe the rights or agreements of the parties and we're also going to describe how to properly fill out paragraphs in 21 through 24 of the residential resale contract okay so these are going to be the ones that we're going to cover we're also going to discover uh, discuss the proper procedure for executing and communicating the acceptance of the one to four family residential resale contract and describe the purpose of the final page of the one to four family re uh, resale or residential resale contract. All right. So again, like I said earlier, this whole page six of the supplemental, if you bought the book, wonderful. If not, we're going to go through the material. Okay. So it's still going to be there. It's just not going to end up being a main one, okay, not something that's major. Uh, because everything I'm showing you, they just basically took, just FYI, those that were talking about supplemental, they just literally took all the forms off of Trek's website, printed it off, and put it into a book. That's all they did. So I'm saving you money by just basically showing you where you can get it. Uh, the parties uh, that negotiate the closing date in paragraph 9A uh, is where we're going to basically state what exactly is going to be the day of closing, okay? So when we, after we finish the lecture, I'm going to pull up a contract, and we're going to go through one and draft one up, and I'm going to explain them from top to bottom, okay? So we're not jumping everywhere, all right? So when we're talking about closing, the parties can negotiate the closing date in paragraph 9A. That's where we're going to negotiate when our closing date is going to be. The closing date is only changed automatically when objections are made under paragraph 6D, okay? So if there is an objection, like we saw at the other class, there can be certain times that there's an automatic extension, okay? But that's only if there are objections that are gonna be made under 6D, okay? That's the only time that it automatically changes, all right? Now, any other change in the closing date will require an amendment to the contract. So if we're not going to object under paragraph 6D, then what happens is if we need to change the closing date, we have to have an amendment, okay? Now, one practice tip for everybody, okay? It is better for you, say that you're not certain that your client, say your client, Mr. Eugene, is a uh, VA loan. Okay, what did I tell you normal close time for a VA loan is? Uh, two to three months. About two to three months, 60 to 90 days. Okay, so would you want to put a closing date of 30 days in the contract? No, you don't. It is best to shoot way out 
because the, if you, when we get to it, you'll see this. It's best to shoot it way out, okay? Because it says on or before blank date. So meaning if you put out 90 days, you could close in 45. Can you see what I'm saying? So that's why they're on or before. You see what I'm saying here, okay? Now, the buyer shall pay for property with good funds. That's another thing that it talks about. <clears throat> Meaning that this is kind of why we don't do checks anymore. Checks are no longer accepted uh, because of the fact is, is with checks, what could end up happening to that, Ms. Linda? What could happen if I write a check? You could get yourself in a lot of trouble. Well, what could happen though to that check? Say I write a check to Mr. Grossman you could who's lose titled. It could be misplaced. It could be misplaced or whatever, but could I have could I end up not having the funds yes. in my account? Insufficient. Insufficient funds, which then basically is not good funds. Right. Okay. So the buyer shall pay for the property with good funds. The seller or will convey title with a general warranty deed. Those are the agreements. Okay. So in these situations is your client has a duty as an obligation. Okay. They have an obligation in this situation to ensure, okay, to ensure that there are going to be good funds and that the seller is going to give good title. So those are the two obligations in the contract. We have to have good funds and good title, okay? Now, in regards to possession, after it's closed, um, let me let me ask uh, Mr. Grossman a question real quick. Mr. Grossman, well, actually, no, Mr. Grossman, I'm going to go pick on you. Mr. Keith, I got a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Keith, my question, sir, is when do you think a party takes control or takes possession of the property? Do you think they take possession at closing or do they take possession at another time? What do you think, sir? I would say a closing. Okay, let me ask you this. It's a little trick question here, okay? So if I walk in and I've signed and I'm the seller and you come in after me and you sign and you're the buyer and we both have signed and we've left title, okay? Is the property now yours? What do you think? I would say no. Right, right. Okay. You're right. It's not yours because it's not funded. That's where I'm coming back to this one here. You see that? Okay. See that second on the screen? That closing and funding. Just because you close does not mean that you actually take control of the property because the funds have not transferred. If you see what I'm saying. Gotcha. Okay. So in that situation. <laughs> What I tell everybody here is a lot of clients, they get so happy, especially if they're the buyer, they are like jumping up and down, okay? I'm closing tonight, yay me, I'm getting my property, okay? But, but here's the thing, is that you're really not actually getting the property until the funds are released. I've had this happen, guys and gals, and I think I might've talked about this in the previous class. I had a transaction, <coughs> I went down to Pearland. Uh, we signed all of our contracts. Everything was done at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, everybody was there. We all signed. And they said, we asked them, well, what time are y'all going to end up funding this, this transaction? And they said, oh, Mr. Nobles, don't worry. We will have it done by noon today. I said, all right, well, we just want to make certain because Labor Day is Monday. So we want everybody good. We want all the money dispersed so everybody can go celebrate because my clients are leaving town Literally right now, they're leaving title to go. So do you need anything else for my clients? Anything? No, 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 we're, we're good, we're good, okay. So me, and at that time, Brandy, we went to go grab lunch, sat down, we had lunch and everything, and uh, we went back to title because we wanted to pick our check up, okay? So we go back to title to get our check, and they said, oh, well, uh, we don't have y'all's checks right now. <clears throat> Well, where's our check? By the way, this is after lunch. So it's already about 1, 1 1.30, we're back there. Well, we don't have your check. Well, where's your where's the check at? Where, where is it at? Oh, well, Mr. Nobles, uh, we see that your, your 
uh, client, he did not actually, his signatures, all they all matched except one document. He didn't like cross and dot, like cross his T and dot the I of it. So we need him to come back and do that so that they'll verify his signature. And I said, but my client is already in San Antonio by now. Okay, he's gone. And they said, well, we can't fund the loan until he comes back and does that. And I said, so if I happen to miraculously get him back here to sign right now, right this minute, will y'all still fund today? And they're like, oh, no, no, it's past. It's about to be 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, that's when all banks cut off the wires. So it's not going to be until Tuesday when he gets his paycheck or his check. I said, excuse me? So the buyer wanted to move in because her granddaughter was having a birthday party at grandma's new house in the swimming pool, but we don't have funds. What happens in that situation, Mr. Eugene? She don't move in. She don't get to move in. Because the fact <laughs> is, is the property hers? No. No, it's not hers. The funds have not transferred. Since the funds have not transferred, she does not get to move in. So we had to end up, guys and gals, and we'll talk about that in this class today, we had to do a temporary residential lease for four days. Talk about a client that was furious. I think I heard probably at least every cuss word in the book that day, okay? Because it was not a cheap house, okay? We're talking like close to a million dollars, all right? So in that situation, it is imperative that you have to make certain that you, as an agent, it is your duty to stay on top of deadlines, okay? One thing that I can tell you is when you're in real estate, you're gonna run into situations that you're gonna need reminders. That's why I always tell people this, and just in my office and just in general. Miss Linda, can you remember every single, every single thing that's going on in my office? Every deadline, every time, one of my agents shows a property, everything. Can you remember all of it with no help? Be honest. No. Why not? It's too much. It's too much. It's too much for one person to remember everything. How many of y'all can barely remember what you're supposed to do this evening after class? Okay. All right. So in that situation, as like I tell people all the time is, is that it is your duty to stay on top of it. But sometimes it's best that you have a couple of people to help you remember. I can tell you, and I've been there before, where I had four closings in one day. Okay, four closings, one day. Great thing, right, Travis? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you got four closings in a day, you're going to be bound and determined to screw something up in one of those closings. I promise you. Okay. So what you have to end up doing is is it is your duty to go in and you have to make certain that you're staying on top of stuff and you're not dropping the ball, okay? So it is key coming back to possession that the parties understand. My parties, I make it clear to my clients, you do not get possession of the property of your buyer until your funds hit their account, which means you don't get the house till I get my what? My commission check. If I don't have my commission check in hand, you ain't getting the keys, okay? So a lot of times at title, the seller will go in and say that, Mr. Grossman, you're selling your property to Miss Linda, okay? Mr. Grossman will go in, he is the seller, he goes to sign, he leaves with Mr. Stahl the keys to the property and the garage door opener and everything else, and he goes on about his merry little way. Okay, Miss Linda comes in to sign, and what do y'all think Mr. Stahl does? After Mr. Miss Miss Linda signs, what do you do, Mr. Stahl? Hand her the keys and the garage door opener. Yep. Here's the keys. Here's the garage door opener. Congratulations on your new house. Okay. Well, what's the problem here? She doesn't own it. She doesn't own it yet. The funds have not transferred. The only time that a title company should ever hand over the keys is if title actually has received funds and they have been dispersed, okay? It is your duty 
as an agent, most of the time what I do is if I'm a selling agent, a listing agent, I will keep the keys. And I will tell the other agent, after Miss Linda, Mr. Eugene, you represent Miss Linda. After Miss Linda signs, okay, and the funds are received, you may come to my office and pick up the keys. Okay? But unless until then, you're not getting the keys. I'm sorry. It's not that I'm being mean. It's the fact of the matter is I need to make certain that funds are going to be there. Okay? That funds are going to clear. It's not that I'm being greedy. It's the fact is, is I have a duty to my seller, Mr. Grossman, to make certain that Miss Linda doesn't move in there and damage the property and her funds don't go through. Okay? Miss Linda, I want to ask you a quick question before we move on. Do you remember that one situation that uh, one of our older agents had here in the office? Uh, do you remember exactly about what happened with a, uh, they got the key out of the lockbox? Do you remember that whole situation? Do you know the details? Do you remember all the details? Okay. I want to give you one other hypothetical. I was going to have Miss Linda tell you, but I'll give you one more because I know you'll probably get tired of my voice, but I wanted to end up uh, kind of explain what's going on. So what happened in this situation was one of my real estate agents, she ended up, she gave, um, she showed a house or let, she was listing. She was a listing agent. She let an agent show a house, show the property. The agent ended up with show the property. The agent came back. They put a contract on it. Everything was great. Whole thing was good. It was supposed to close, I believe, the next day. No, I'm sorry. It was the weekend. It was over the weekend. It was on a Friday. <clears throat> she ended up, they called, because what it was, was the agent, the buyer's agent, was going to be going out of the state for the weekend. And ended up, she asked my agent, can I allow my assistant to come open up the house so that they can do their final walkthrough before closing on Monday. My agent said, certainly, we want to work with you. I mean, you're about to buy the house, most well, certainly you can. So my agent ended up on Saturday morning, called me and said, Justin, did you get any uh, message or any notification of the showing being terminated. And I said, no ma'am, I did not. She said, I'm gonna go drive by the property because normally when you put the key back in, it prompts your phone to say, is the showing over? And you get yes or no, okay? And so I never got that. So what ended up happening was Miss, uh, my client or my, my, my agent went and drove by the property and noticed that there was vehicles there, but it did not look like the agent or any assistant, any real estate agent was present. There was a bunch of workers present that had already stripped out the ceiling fan, had stripped out some of the furnishings, had taken some of the sheetrock off, all of this stuff, and we had not even got to the closing table. Okay. And ended up, oh yes, and the locks were changed. Okay. All within this whole situation here. My agent took pictures, did not confront anybody, just took pictures, came back, called me, told me. I said, you need to contact that agent, that buyer's agent immediately and find out what's going on. Of course, the buyer's agent didn't respond because she's out of town. Buyer's agent finally ended up responded on Monday. And my agent just went off on her and basically said, I hope your client actually closes this transaction because if your client does not close this transaction, they just got a bunch of brand new stuff that they're not giving any, any of it back on. It's all theirs. That is one of the key things is, is a client is never, number one, never supposed to have keys to a property they don't own. We cannot confirm it, but we have very high suspicion that they ended up, that they actually, the agent had went over on Friday 
made copies of the keys and gave them a copy of the key. So in that situation, highly, highly, highly not right. It gets you in a lot of trouble. A lot. It's, it's so much trouble, you would most likely, had we proceed, we did take action at a, at a lower level, and it was taken care of, but had we proceed to Trek, what do you think would have happened, Mr. Stahl, to that agent? All their license would have happened. That's right. Their license would have been suspended or revoked. And that'd been it. I'd been done. Okay? But I was not going to be that way. Okay? So again, you have to understand in these situations that the parties have to agree when possession is going to take place. Now, that can be, of course, at closing and funding. So it may either be at closing and funding or according to a temporary residential lease. If the buyers in that hypothetical, well, it's not even hypothetical, it's a real practical situation. If the buyers had ended up in a situation, had they told us that's what they wanted to do, we would have done a buyer temporary residential lease with the terms in there and we would have let it happen. Okay? We would have negotiated but how they did it was completely wrong and definitely would have caused a major issue had something happened. It is important for both to check with their insurance agents when possession is different from the closing and the funding. This is huge. This is humongous, guys and gals. This bottom one, this Linda. Yes, sir. When you were part or your your own insurance company's agent, one of the agents that worked for the insurance company, can't remember her name off the top of my mind, my mind. She had just bought a house and she was about to, what was her name? Jane. Jane. This lady, Miss Jane, was about to end up purchasing a house yes. and she actually was going to, she actually had funded, like the funding had occurred, but there was a lapse. She had there was two different dates on winter stuff. They closed earlier than the funding date. Okay. So the closing date was X day, but it ended up on Y day. It actually closed. So it was previous to the actual date because her insurance agent had put the closing date, the wrong date on it. What ended up happening in the situation was she closed and funded. She went out to the property and Miss Linda, what ended up happening to her property? I want to say the light, there was a storm, the lightning struck it That's and, right. and burnt it to the ground. And it burnt to the ground. And she lost everything. She lost it all. She, here's the key thing, <laughs> is what happens is in a situation, when you're dealing with this, if the insurance agent, it is imperative that if you say February 12th, 2021, we're having closing, but you actually close February 1st, 2021, what happens? What did most, what does a client most likely do? They put it for the 12th. They didn't think I need to change my insurance to the first. If they move in on the second or the first or whatever, and it burns to the ground, they have no insurance. They're out of it. Okay. So in that situation, and this part guys and gals, this bottom bullet is where you as a real estate agent are huge in talking about liability purposes. Mr. Stahl, Mr. Grossman, y'all too, and myself. <clears throat> if we don't advise our clients before they go to fund to make certain they have uh, insurance protection on their property, we're liable. We're liable. Okay. It is your duty as a real estate agent to end up, we got to confirm that. And by the way, our errors and admissions insurance doesn't cover for that. Of course, right? Our errors and admissions insurance is only for errors and admissions within the contract, not within a house burning to the ground. Okay. So in that situation is, is that we end up, it is our duty to inform them. That's why Miss Nobles, especially if you come work in my firm or you work for another firm, what ends up happening is Miss Nobles, she will go through and make sure that that form is completed because there is a form that actually says, Notice about insurance to buyer and seller. As long as your clients have signed it, now what happens to the liability? It's all of us, okay? But if your client didn't sign it, you're responsible, okay? So very important on that. Now, 
talking about temporary residential lease. Now, if the seller, in a situation, they are selling a property, and the seller is selling the property, and they want to stay in the property after closing and funding, then they have to end up, they have to complete a seller's uh, temporary lease, okay? Now, with that being said, it is a lease agreement. It is an actual lease agreement. Therefore, all rent and deposits must be made at closing. All rent and deposits must be made at closing. Okay. Now, we have currently Mr. Uh, Mr. Grossman, you have one right now that you're working on with a seller's temporary lease. Is it cheap to have a seller's temporary lease? No, because you have to pay up front for what the term is. So say you do it for six months, you're going to have to pay six months rent. Well, the maximum that you can go is 90 days. 90 days, right and a deal. So if you do 90 days with a temporary residential lease, you can only, you got to pay the entire lease, the three months up front at closing, but also you got to pay security deposits. So say that a client's charging 2000 a month, two, four, six for three months, and they want to have a month. So you got two, four, six, $8,000 that you got to pay up front for a temporary residential lease. See your problem there. Okay. So a lot of clients, they'll want this. Okay. But in the same situation is they don't want to end up, they don't want to get locked into the contract or, or my favorite one, Mr. Grossman, we, we discussed this already. What if say, for example, that uh, Mr. Keith in this situation, he's your client. He wants to sell a temporary lease. He wants a 90 day lease so he can find another property. And after he signs all the paperwork, he pays his $8,000. Mr. Keith finds a property and ends up moving out the next day after the closing heat on his property. Does he get all that money back? Mm -hmm. Say that a little louder so they can hear? No, he doesn't. Why doesn't he? Because it's already gone. Because the, the contract says that none of it is refundable except for the possible security deposit. So if Mr. Keith pays $6,000, okay, to Mr. Stahl, then he stays in it for one day after closing and then says, hey, Mr. Stahl, I found my house. I'm going to move out. Uh, can I have my money back? Mr. Stahl said, nope. That's my money. I get to keep it. Okay. So that's why I always tell my clients all the time, if you want to do a lease, do a real lease. Don't do a temporary lease. Because in a real lease, all you got to pay is one month of rent and one security deposit. And if you happen to find a lease or find a place, then you move out. Just do a short-term real lease, not a long-term, uh, not, a, not a temporary lease in that situation. Okay. Same thing applies with buyer's temporary lease. <laughs> it's just different. Instead of the seller staying in the property, the buyer's asking, hey, can I move in early? I'm about to be homeless, can I move in? Okay, again, all rents and deposits must be paid at move in. Again, they cannot last more than 90 days and the landlords are not subject to landlord tenant laws in these situations. Okay, they're not subjected to them. But again, if you're on the person that wants to say that I'm the seller and the buyer wants a temporary lease, yeah, come on, send that money our way. But if you're on the person that needs it, you want to try to write that contract that's going to end up being in the favor of the tenant. Now, again, are the entire security still there? Yes. And truthfully, this is what I tell people all the time is, the landlord is not subjected to landlord-tenant laws. However, however, this little clause down here at the bottom can put your landlord at a lot of liability. A lot of liability, okay? There are many different ways. It is better, well, a lot of people like to use these forms, it's better to create a temporary residential lease if the party's gonna stay for a month or two for the tenant 
But if it's going to be a two, three, four, five, six month lease, it's better to have a full blown lease for the protections that come with the notices. Okay. That's why one lease that I'm working on right now, I had to look at both options and I had to find out which one was going to protect my landlord more than my tenant in the situation. I had to make certain that I'm weighing my options. And I found out that it would be more of protection and more flexible. That's another thing with these leases. It allows more flexibility. So with this temporary lease, it does not offer flexibility. With a regular lease, you have the flexibility. Meaning that if a party wants to breach it, say that a buyer ends up in a situation, say Mr. Stahl, that you end up, you're wanting to stay in your property while you're looking for another property. You have a normal lease agreement. Miss Linda, you're the landlord. If you find something and say Mr. Or Mr. Grossman wants to come in and lease the property, well, what can happen is, is the regular lease has the subletting language in it. This does not, which means then we would have to do a completely different deal that costs the landlord more money. Do you see what I'm saying? So in that situation is it's in, it just depends on the situation. So I can't tell you all the time what's the best option until I'm put in that place. I have to look at the bigger picture in these situations. Now, special provisions in this particular situation. Special provisions is that the licensee may add business details and factual statements in paragraph 11. Okay. Now, care must be taken to never add anything that changes the legal rights of parties. Parties need to seek legal advice to add things that are going to change the legal rights. Okay. So in this particular situation is you can put basic business details. There's no problem with that. You can put business details. I have no problem with that, but you cannot go in and say, if this happens, then they're going to be sued for $500 and win. Okay. You can only state the business parties, the business details. Licensees must not add anything to special provisions for a situation, which there is a trick form. If there's been a trek form that's been created, you do not just go add it. For example, if I want the, uh, the stove, the refrigerator, the washer, the dryer, and the computer desk to stay, I don't put that in special provisions. I put that in the form we talked about the other night, non-realty items. Okay. So when you're going through this, you got to make certain that you're understanding this rhythm here. Okay. Now, Settlement and other expenses. Paragraph 12 defines which are buyer's cost and which are seller's cost. Now, this is going to be a big one, and we're going to talk about this when we actually sit down and go through the form. But basically what this does is it's a little tricky, crooked way how some agents do. So if, for example, say Mr. Jacob is selling a property to you, Mr. Eugene, and you submit an offer to Mr. Jacob and he has it listed for say $300,000. Okay. Well, you want Mr. Jacob to be like, he's going to accept your offer. Okay. So you tell Mr. Jacob, you send him an offer and in the offer you say in it at the front, at the top, remember if y'all remember yesterday, paragraph three, you put that basically you're paying $300,000 in this paragraph, paragraph 12, guess what? Paragraph 12 is where you can end up putting in that the seller will give you money. So say that you actually wanted to offer Mr. Jacob 290, but you don't want him to get flagged when he first sees the contract. So you'll put $10,000 in paragraph 12. So when Mr. Jacob gets the contract, he sees $300,000. But if he quickly is going through it and doesn't read it and signs, he now has agreed to pay you $10,000 of your closing cost, which means he basically got $290,000. Okay. So in that situation is that's the, always the thing. Whenever I get an offer in and it's full price and, and you know, I got a new agent and they're like, Oh my God, I got a full price offer. I got a full price offer. I'm like, no, no, no. Change paragraph 12. Let me see paragraph 12. 
Let me look at this. Yeah, yeah, no, you didn't get a full price offer. You got an offer that's basically a crooked way of doing things. Okay, it's not illegal, not wrong. It's just a crooked way of doing things. Okay. <laughs> Say that a little louder, Mr. Travis, so they hear it. But we still get commission on the full price of the property. That's right. The only thing so, that really so what happens is in this situation, poor Mr. Jacobs getting in that hypothetical the bad end of the deal, because what's happening is he's getting 290, but he's still got to pay six percent on the total amount. Yes. Okay. So it's a crooked way, and that's why a lot of times when I see contracts like that, I will quickly, especially if it is one of my my people, I quickly will spot it and say, no, 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 well, how about we drop the price and let's get rid of these concessions. Now, I will say something. If it is a VA loan or sometimes an FHA loan, the contract has to be written like that so that because the buyer or the seller has to give money back to the buyer okay so and sometimes you got to do it but if it's a conventional loan yeah no that's complete BS and they're lying to you if they tell you that okay they're just they're not telling the truth now paragraph 12b says that if an expense exceeds an amount agreed to by one at one to the parties then the contract, that party may terminate the contract unless the other party agrees to pay the excess. Okay, we're going to talk about that when we get there. Again, common sense. I'm just trying to hit the main points, so and let's keep this going. Paragraph 13. What is the word to you, uh, Mr. Garrett? What does uh, prorations mean to you? I'm going to bag up so you can't see that. What does proration mean to you, Mr. Garrett? Um, I don't what's, know. What's a ration sound to you? Like a ratio. What's a ratio sound like to you? You ever heard the phrase two to one? Yes, sir. Okay. Means basically that there could be a split two to one for every two. There's one uh, option. Okay. What's happening is, is in proration, it's kind of the same thing. We're splitting it up. So that it ends up in the situation, like it says here, we're splitting up the expenses to the party that is responsible for them. Okay, so it, like it says here, paragraph 13 explains that since taxes are paid in arrears, what's arrears, Travis? They, you pay that year before. Yeah, you pay the year before. That's right. So you're paying 2020's taxes when, Miss Linda? That's right. Say it louder so I hear you. Oh, 2021. 2021. So you're paying, you're getting to basically get the benefit for the year, and then you pay for it after that year. Okay, that's arrears. So since taxes are paid in arrears, many times tax prorations are based on the previous year's numbers, and that if that amount turns out to be incorrect, when the actual tax bill is available, the parties will work that out. Now, this is where it kind of gets very confusing here. Okay, play out a hypothetical here. So, Mr. Grossman, you and I, you're selling your property to me. I'm purchasing your property, okay? So I come in, Mr. Grossman, and I tell you, uh, I'm buying your property, we come to terms on, on a mountain and everything, we get to closing, and they pulled Miss Linda here in this situation, she's the title company, she pulled the tax records from last year, okay? So she pulled the tax records from 2019, because we're dealing with 2020, full tax records from 2019, and the tax for, for the tax value in 2019 was $5,000. And you lived in it one half the year, and I lived in it one half of the year. So how much do you owe, Mr. Grossman, in taxes? And how much do I owe? So we both owe $2,500, okay? So... We both end up, you owe 25, I owe 25. So Miss Linda, when she does her HUD and closing and all, both of us prorated, our prorated tax is 25, 25. Well, after I move into the house that I purchased from you, I get the tax bill for the time that I had it, or that you were in it for six months and I was in it. So I get in here and I get the tax bill and it's $10,000.
What's the problem there? Mr. Grossman should have paid 5,000 and I should have paid 5,000. But Mr. Grossman only paid 2,500 because that's what 2019 showed. So what happens is my only option is, is I get to, what's the say here, Travis? Work it out. We'll work that out. Now, Mr. Travis, you've been dealing with transactions for a while. How easy is it to just call up that other person and say, hey, you owe me $2,500. Oh, they always are so happy. They're ecstatic, yeah. right? Oh, I'd love to pay you more money. Uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> that how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every time. Every time, right? They just, I want to pay more money. How much more do you want? Yeah, right? exactly. It's yeah. like this. Click. Yeah. Well, while you're saying that, Mr. Eugene, you just go click. That's, that's it. That's so you wouldn't you wouldn't be gladly writing another twenty five hundred to me? Click. Uh, no. No. No English. No English. Yeah. No English. <laughs> yeah, no English. <laughs> Uncle Prende. Now, Mr. Grossman, would you do that to me if I called you and asked for my twenty five hundred dollars? Probably. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Probably too. It's absolutely. So in that situation, is yes. Unfortunately, when you're doing taxes or you're prorating, when it's in arrears, you're not always guaranteed that it's going to be 100% correct. And it especially where this happens, guys and gals, this part right here happens, the, the whole entire working it out, doesn't happen normally on a house that's a resale. It happens on new builds. Okay? Because what happens is, is that Mr. Uh, say Mr. Jacob, he's buying some land, and that land in 2019 was only assessed at $60,000. Mr. Jacob builds a 10,000 square foot home on that property where he can barbecue. Where he can, he can barbecue, Miss Nobles is saying. And she says she's still waiting on that for me, Mr. Jacob. She wants some barbecue. But in the situation <laughs> is, she ends up. We can have that big house that he built, but guess what's going to happen? The tax assessed value is not going to hit till the year after the house is fully completed. Yeah. So if Mr. Jacob bought the land for $60,000, he builds a big old house. Big old he goes and ends up and tries to sell that house. What's the taxes going to be? Well, no, they're, when he goes to closing, it's going to be based off of the $60,000. So the, the per, so when they get taxes, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be, you owe me out of 60000 Mr. Jacob says to you, Mr. Eugene, I'm selling you the house. So the, the title is going to say, well, Miss, Mr. Eugene, we're basing it off of sixty. So since we're basing it here, you're going to pay, say, $1,000, and Mr. Jacob's going to pay $1,000. Okay, well, that sounds all fine and dandy at that point, but when the tax comes up for 2022, you're going to get hit with probably a $15,000, $20,000 bill, and then you're going to be calling Mr. Jacob going, whoa, you owe me some more money, and he's going to say, what'd you say? Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no English. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah, no English click. Don't you know who you are. Change phone number. Change phone number and leave. What house? I don't, I've never owned a house. That's right. So in that situation is, that's where there can be, and I, I kind of joke around with that, but it, it's the truth. I've actually had a client in that situation. They went to closing, went in, new house. They based it off, I think her tax bill that they took out was $48. Both of them paid like about 40, 58 bucks. Somewhere it was low, low. That's the land was cheap. And ended up, she called me and she's like, hey, um, Justin, I just got a tax bill for this next year and uh, it's way expensive. I need to get my money back for the time that they had. And I'm like, well, you have more rights to call them. And I tried to help her get in contact with them, but they actually did, Travis, what you said. They changed their phone number. <laughs> change their phone number and we could never get a hold to them. So in that situation, probations, while you are legally responsible, you still got to go find them. And especially if that person's moving out of state, good luck finding them. Casualty loss. Paragraph 14 says that the seller is responsible for anything that changes during the time the property is pending and will restore the property to its previous condition. Extremely important here. This comes back to that insurance uh, issue. 
had Miss, what was her name again? Jane? Uh, Jane. Jane. Had Miss Jane not fund it and the house got struck and burnt to the ground, the seller would have had to use their insurance to rebuild the house for her. Okay. Now, most of the time, if a house burns to the ground, it, it allows for both parties to do what? We talked about this way back in, in the beginning of this class. If the house burns to the ground, it's impossible. And what happens to both parties? Contract's dead. Well, dead on its face. Okay. But again, it states in here, if anything changes during the time that the property is pending, the seller must restore the property to its previous condition. No ifs and buts. Prime one, my dad can tell you this from his, his brother. We were working on a contract, trying to get under, under a contract, work negotiations. And all of a sudden I get a call from my uncle who has listed his property and says, uh, yeah, do you have any vendors? The, uh, was it the water heater? Water yeah, the water heater uh, was in the attic and burst it and flooded down all of the walls on the second floor. Okay, when that happens, it's got to be fixed. Yep. Seller has to put it back to its previous condition. Okay, so in that situation, it's imperative when you're dealing with this, that there has to be casualty loss. If there is, it is the responsibility of the seller. Okay, default, we'll talk about this one, but I want to get this real quick. Default's going to be in paragraph 15. It explains that if either party defaults under the contract, so it doesn't matter, seller or buyer, defaults under the contract, the other party has the right to either, here we go, specific performance, Ms. Linda, what's specific performance? It forces them to purchase the house. Yes. Okay, or sell the house if it's a seller, sell the house, sue for damages, or accept the earnest money and everybody's released from the contract. So here's my thing. Mr. Grossman, I've got a question for you. So if I feel like my client has ended up in a situation, I have a feeling that my client has breached the contract, do you think I'm going to say, hey, go sue my client? No. Why not? Because it's your client. Yeah, yeah. no. What do you think I'm going to push for? Am I going to push for them to force us to buy the house when we can't get the funds? No, what am I going to shoot for? Accept the earnest money. I want to, if I know, if I'm in a contract with you, Travis, and I know Steph is screwed up, and he's royally screwed up, I'm going to send you a, a, a not a termination, but a earnest, release of earnest money to you instantaneous. And say, hey, uh, Travis, I sent over the earnest money stuff, so you know my client's unable to get the property. Can you just have your client sign that and send that back to me? I'm greatly appreciate it, man. Sure. And I'm hoping that Travis is going to do what? Sure. Yes, I'll send that. Yeah. Sure, man. Let me send that. Let me send that on over real quick and get that back to you. Because the minute that that happens, they lose the right to sue for specific performance or sue for damages. Everybody's released from the contract. Okay. If a client, if you ever send a form over and the agent says I send it to Travis and Travis says, uh, no, we're consulting our attorney, your, your key thing you tell your client, you need to go call, call an attorney immediately, quickly. You need to get them on the phone. Okay. And of course the broker themselves is going to get their attorney on the phone. Okay. Because that means if y'all are going to consult with an attorney, what are you most likely going to do, Mr. Travis? Somebody suing somebody. Somebody suing somebody is coming. It's just any minute. Okay. Because they sure ain't going to have COVID that time. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the key thing is, is that you want to make certain that your parties understand that. Once one of the parties have accepted the earnest money, they cannot take any other action, period. That's why I said I push it. I shove it in their face. I'm like, sign. My favorite one. Best way, well, you got to be careful with this, but I, I've talked to my attorney before. If Travis, say, for example, had Mr. Eugene as his assistant, and Mr. And Mr. Travis, you told me that Mr. Eugene was your assistant and I could communicate with him, and Miss Linda is your client, okay, she's a seller, and Mr. Grossman screwed up a transaction, sometimes what do you think I might do if I'm kind of worried you might catch on to it? I'll send it to Mr. Eugene. And Mr. Eugene is an assistant, so Mr. Eugene's going to do what? Send it straight to Miss Linda. 
And he's going to send to Miss Linda. And Miss Linda's going to sign because she's the seller. And then in that situation, Mr. Eugene's going to send it back to me. And now what just happened? You just snuck it by. Me. I snuck it by and I ended up, I got it. Yep. Okay. But again, that, that steal, that steal could still be challenged in a court of law. Because they would say, that's why a lot of times I'll BCC. I'll send it to Eugene and I'll direct the email to Eugene, but I'll BCC Travis on it. And sometimes if you're a real estate agent, you're busy as can be, you look down and you see, oh, Justin just sent an email to Eugene. Okay, well, Eugene will take care of it for me and you go on about your day. Then at that point, it's a fair deal. It's a tough deal. But if I just send it to Eugene and only Eugene, there could be concerns, there could be issues because I did not notify the other agent. All right, this is my favorite. Guys, I get so ecstatic when I talk about this because I actually teach this course, okay? And let me see here. Ms. Lila, are you there? Yes. Ah, she's there. It's been so long since I've talked to you. How have you been? Uh, I'm okay. She's doing great, by the way. So me and her, real, real quick backstory, me and her did our counseling supervision together. And this woman is extremely intelligent. That's why I'm having her take the classes, because I know she's going to be great in, in getting her license. But I was going to so kind. I wanted to say this, though, to you. Have you yet, with your counseling, have you ever utilized mediation yet? No, that's something I'm actually starting to look into. Awesome. So me and you need to talk, by the way. So I'm gonna yes, go we do. I'm going to give you a little bit of information real quick, but I wanted to bring this to your attention tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some information and give everybody information. So in this situation, what happens here is with mediation, it deals with paragraph 16, and it encourages the parties to consider mediation. Now, as a counselor, it is my duty, it's my obligation, that I want to end up, we try to help people that are in, that are having problems. That's our job, okay? As a mediator, this fits with my profession. It fits with real estate, and it also fits with counseling. It's kind of a two-folded uh, shield here. So what happens is paragraph 16 encourages the parties to consider mediation if a dispute arises that cannot be settled by themselves. So... <clears throat> A lot of people think that the only person that can be a mediator is a, is a lawyer or a judge. That's the only people that can be a mediator. And that is 100% false. Has any of you ever seen Judge Judy or heard of the name Judge Judy? Okay. Judge Judy is a arbitrator, which it comes from the same family of mediation. So I'll give you a kind of little backstory. So arbitration and mediation all come under the umbrella of what's called alternative dispute resolution okay so when people normally have an issue what do you think we talk a lot in this class about what if somebody breaches a contract what happens we sue somebody has to somebody yeah sue 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 right well in this situation mediation is actually in the contract and it's in paragraph 16 that encourages the parties to consider mediation if a dispute arises that cannot be settled by themselves. It is, number one, it's low cost. Number two, it's faster, much quicker than any litigation. Number three, it's private, whereas everything that happens or is said in a court is going to be public. And number four, it's a win-win. It's offering an opportunity for both parties to win. So the parties to the mediation share the cost equally. So what happens here, unlike litigation, and I've worked in the law field before, and I know the experience here, in litigation is the person with the most money is going to win the case, period. The person with the most money is going to win even if they have the worst case, okay? The reason being is, is because the fact is, is they can continue to file motion after motion after motion after motion after motion after motion because they have unlimited reserves. Okay. But if Mr. Grossman, if I'm going to sue you and say you only have 5,000 to your name, well, just to get an attorney to your name, it's going to cost you about 2,500 bucks. 
And that's going to give you about maybe 30 to 60 days if you're lucky. Okay. Well, all I got to do is wear you out in money wise and still was the problem ever actually resolved? No, it wasn't. The problem still stands. You just ended up, you just now got even more hatred for me because I just ended up, I caused you problems. I took your money. Okay. With mediation, number one, it's low cost. And number two, that cost is split between both parties so that the monies, no matter what, is never going to be about a money matter. So it keeps the, the field, the playing field, equal for both parties. Okay. So Mr. Grossman never has to, even though he may only have 5000 and I have millions in the bank, we say, yeah, I wish, but say so that was the deal. Then what ends up happening is it doesn't matter if I have millions in the bank. We still are going to pay the same rate because we got to split it in half. And normally, mediation for a four hour mediation depends upon the person and experience at all can run as little as about $500. Some people go up when I do mediations, sometimes three to four thousand. Okay, and that's for about a four hour day. Okay, now what happens is. Is it depends, but even at say even at my part at four or five thousand a day, what would you be paying for an attorney in litigation? Thousands. Guys, when I did divorces, when I used to work for an attorney that did divorces, we sometimes depending on the, the estate, it could end up being close to sixty to seventy thousand dollars for a divorce. Okay. A lot of people don't understand this. With divorces, you can actually end up do an entire divorce. Do the paperwork yourself, do everything, because it's 60 days, you gotta wait. You can do it all and have your divorce within. If you use mediation and everybody works together, you could probably be divorced for 500 bucks. Okay, you could. But the key thing is, is people don't know this. This is one of those parts that attorneys like to squash. Okay, it's not that they're trying to squash it, it's the same thing like a real estate agent. We don't want people to bring in Zillow and all these other ones because they're putting us out of business. Same thing attorneys do. They don't want third parties that are non attorneys to come in and take their clientele. Okay. So, of course, it comes into that situation. But there are a lot of benefits to mediation. You have, of course, low cost, it's fast. You literally, the standard in Texas is you have to stay when you file for a divorce, there's a 60 day waiting period. File for divorce today, you got to wait 60 days before you can end up finalizing that divorce. But if you think about this, you end up in this situation, you go, you do mediation, they file for divorce, they go to a mediator, and some mediations, I've done this before, mediator will come in and the mediator takes the role of more of a judge, but a collaborative counseling type judge. And so what happens is, is say, Miss Eugene, Miss Linda, I would come in in this situation as a hypothetical. I'd come in here and I say, okay, I understand y'all are both wanting to divorce. Let's talk. And I'd use it as a counseling opportunity to try to help rectify, try to get you back together. If it can't work, then I say, okay, since we can't make this work, how about we go mediation and let's split everything, come to an agreement, and then you take that to attorney Stefan, and Mr. Stefan can write up a final degree of divorce. You spend maybe a week with me working, may end up paying me $5,000, $6,000 for a, work, a week of work. And then Stefan charges you maybe two fifty dollars to draft up the paperwork, $6,200, and you call it a day and you walk away. Versus if you go into a court of law, you go hire Travis, who's an attorney, Mr. Eugene. Do you think, Travis, that you're going to want to make them quickly resolve the problem? Oh, no, I'll we'll drag it out. Why do you want to drag it out, Mr. Travis? That's more money for me. That's right. I thought I thought I was your friend. If I'm an attorney, I want to I'll drag it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it comes into that situation is it's going to, when it's an attorney, yeah. attorneys get paid. It's just like for real estate. I mean, I'm not picking on attorneys in here. It's just like real estate agents. You got two houses that your client wants to buy, and one of your clients wants to buy, you know, you see a house that's 500000 you see one that's four hundred. Which one are you going to go show, Mr. Grossman? Why are you going to show the 500000 It's a bigger commission. It's, it's business. It's business one-on-one. It's how it works. It's how it always works. Okay? But the key thing comes back to it is, is that they're going to, when you hire an attorney, they want to battle it out as long as they can because the more money in their pocket. Okay? They're paid hourly. Now, 
when dealing with it also being fast, like I said, you, you can complete a divorce within normally about 60 days and it'll be finished, okay? It also is private. When you go in and you go litigate stuff, all of that is public information. It's public. Travis could go down if he wanted to, if I'm having a lawsuit, Travis could go down there and pull everything about it, see the whole file, see everything that's going on, and it is clear as day. Mediation, it's private. You don't know nothing. Everything is said within the con or within the room is confidential. Nobody else knows about it, period. Okay? Everything that's said in mediation, even if the mediation falls apart, say for example that Mr. Eugene in this situation, say that me and you sit down and we're trying to work this out and it ends up, we can't come to an agreement. And we got all these papers and documents and all, I can't share that with anybody. And that's not, you can't subpoena those documents. Those are confidential documents. So what happened is it can't be touched, okay? So it stays private. Another thing is in mediation, the goal is we're trying to get a win-win for both parties. If Miss Linda and Mr. Eugene in a, in a real estate transaction, you're upset at each other. Mediation is, it's not with the focus of, I'm trying to see which one of you is right or wrong. I'm coming into this. How can we make Mr. Eugene and Miss Linda happy? That's the view I'm looking at. How can both of them leave this room happy and not mad? Now, you're not always gonna be in that situation, but again, that's the point of it. I'd love to spend time on that one. And I could talk to about arbitration and, and all these other fact finding courts and all this, but there's so much an alternative dispute resolution. It's so interesting. Okay. I've been doing arbitrations and mediations for a while now. Love them. They're wonderful. They're great things. I actually got certified to teach. I've actually got to renew my stuff. I sent some of the paperwork in, but I've been teaching and all, and it's something that I like to do. It's something that a lot of real estate agents, I feel it's very beneficial because a lot of times, in Houston, you'll see them, but in like smaller rural counties, there's not anybody that's a real estate mediator. There's nobody. So this is an extra way that you could end up making some extra funds on the side. It's another different way. So again, if you ever thinking about your real estate license and your mediation license, there you go, you can get them both. We can talk about it. Um, now attorney fees. Attorney's fees are gonna be paragraph 17. And it says that the prevailing party in any legal proceeding is entitled to recover their attorney's fees. Texas courts have frequently used this paragraph to assert that licensees be reimbursed for their legal fees when prevailing in a lawsuit. So here's the thing, guys and gals. If you as a real estate agent, I just want everybody to know this. If, for example, Mr. Eugene, I'm rep or well, let's put it this way. Mr. Stahls represent you in a real estate transaction. Mr. Stahl goes over and he screwed up something which caused you to breach the contract, okay? So in that situation, he went over and he screwed up the situation. Well, now guess what ended up happening, Mr. Eugene? You're going to sue nobody or are you going to sue somebody? That's the first I'm question. I'm going to sue somebody. You're going to sue somebody, Yeah. okay? Are you just going to sue Mr. Stahl? No, I'm coming after broker. Why are you coming after me? Because, hey, you sound to you. That's you're right. You're main man. That's right. So in that situation, on, what's going to okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what happens here is in that situation is the realist or the client is going to sue both the agent and the real estate broker. Okay. So what happens is, and this is where it can be very detrimental in some situations, a real estate broker has to end up, they have to get their own attorney, okay? We have to have our own counsel. The agent is advised in that situation to get his own attorney, okay? Because who do you think the real estate broker is gonna look out for? The agent or the broker? The broker. The broker, <laughs> because they wanna get the liability off of who? They're gonna get the liability off of the broker to the agent. Well, hold on. <laughs> That's why what happens is a broker will say in this hypothetical, I may have, say Mr. Grossman is my, my counsel, okay? What would happen is Mr. Grossman is going to advise me to evoke 
my errors and admissions insurance so that the insurance company will go in and cover you for your attorney. And so they appoint Miss Linda to you as your attorney. See, you messed up with you. you <laughs> it's funny because you need to see what he needs to That's how it all worked out, right? <laughs> so in this situation is, is that yes, a real estate broker, of course, their job, the attorney's job, even though the agent is a person underneath them, there's a reason we have insurance. Because what happens is, is the attorney is going to cover the broker, but the agent will also end up needing to have you know to cover them. And that's why there will be two attorneys. Now, two attorneys are going to work together to benefit everybody, but you got to have everybody their own legal representation. Okay. Escrow. Paragraph 18 discusses what happens when a transaction does not close and is terminated. Okay. If the parties agree on distribution of the earnest money, they each sign a termination agreement and the title company is going to release the earnest money. Okay. The title company can only deduct the expenses made on behalf of the parties receiving the earnest money. Okay. So if you get through a contract and you're going along through the contract and you get to say after inspections and you can't come to an agreement, everybody can't come to some consensus then what happens in this situation is that the parties would both need to sign a form, have the money released pursuant to the terms of the agreement. But let me ask you this. <clears throat> Say that Mr. Uh, Garrett ends up, he's purchasing your house, Mr. Grossman, and Mr. Garrett decides that, uh, you know, he's purchasing your house. He's putting a lot of effort and time into buying your house, Mr. Grossman. And he's trying to get it because he's under a contingency to sell his property, okay? And Mr. Grossman, you just decide willy-nilly that you're gonna pull out and accept another offer. Do you think Mr. Garrett's gonna be happy with you? No. No, Mr. Garrett's gonna be extremely upset at you. Extremely upset. And Mr. Garrett's gonna do what? Mr. Garrett's going to turn around, and because Mr. Grossman did that, Mr. Garrett may say a few choice words to you, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, Mr. Garrett goes over, and he says those choice words, and then his agent sends over a release of earnest money. Mr. Garrett signed it and sent it to you. You're mad, aren't you? Yeah, because you just got chewed out. Are you going to sign that form? Nope. Both parties and both brokers have to sign the form. I'll say it again. Both parties and both brokers have to sign the form. If one of them does not sign the form, guess what happens to that security deposit? It stays locked up in title until something is done. Do you see why I say earnest money? You don't want to put a ton of money in there? Because any little thing could do what to it? Okay. It could tie it up in that thing. And I, I already know of one transaction that I was not personally involved in, but I know of, that probably is still locked up. And it was over $25,000 in earnest money. And you know what the sad part is? Because sometimes that money just sits in the bank and the title company's making what off of it? Sometimes interest. So they're benefiting from it. Okay. So again, it has to be very important. The title company, again, like it says, can only deduct the their expenses made or on behalf of the parties that are receiving the earnest money. If a party wrongly refuses to release the earnest money, the other party can do what? Sue, Sue them for damages plus the earnest money plus the court costs and the attorney's fees. Okay. But again, if it's a thousand dollar earnest money, or even sometimes two thousand, is it even worth trying to sue? Because your retainer for an attorney is going to be what twenty five hundred, and you're taking a 50-50 shot of them actually going over and releasing that earnest money. Okay. Now either party has the right to make a written demand to the escrow agent for the earnest money. If only one party makes a written demand, the escrow agent will send a copy of that demand to the other party. 
if the escrow agent making the demand, uh, if the escrow agent making the demand less the amount of unpaid expenses on behalf of the party, the contract says that the parties will release the escrow agent from any adverse claims if these procedures are followed. So as long as the escrow agents follow what they're supposed to, you cannot sue the escrow agent. Now imagine this. Imagine the real estate broker did not properly, or the real estate agent did not properly advise their clients of escrow. Who also is getting sued? The agent and the broker. Okay. So when dealing with these things, it is imperative that you're on top of your game. Okay? Extremely imperative. When dealing with representations, representations deal with paragraph 19. It says that all representations, covenants, and warranties survive closing. Okay? The seller has the right to continue to show the property, receive negotiation, and accept backup offers. Okay? Notices. Notices are effective when mailed out or mailed to or delivered to the address. This is that part, if you remember last night that we talked about, this is that part that you could, when completing the contract, if the party, if say Mr. Grossman goes in and spills the beans and gives all of the information for their client, Mr. Grossman, you just gave me a new lead. Okay, just gave me a new lead. So notices are effective when mailed to or delivered to the address, email address, or fax number listed on paragraph 21. Licensees need to ask parties what information they want to put in this contract. Okay. Agreements of the parties. All addenda or attachments that are a part of the original contract are going to be listed in paragraph 22. The following forms are never listed in paragraph 22. They are not notices and or they are notices and not addendas. And you'll notice Seller's disclosure, seller's disclosure notice, information about brokerage services, and the TAR notification of intermediary relationship forms are not going to be included with the contract. They're just notices. Termination option. We talked about this yesterday. In paragraph 23, the buyer can purchase an option to terminate the contract within a specific number of days. The intent of this paragraph is to give the buyer time to do their due diligence. Inspections, bids for insurance, checking deed restrictions should all be done during this period to assert there is nothing about the home that will not be satisfactory to the buyer. It is very important the option money be delivered to the seller or the seller's agent by 5 p.m. within the three days stated in paragraph 23. Option money should never be delivered to a third party like an escrow agent. I'm going to re-emphasize that for my people that live in Houston, Austin, Dallas, or any other metroplex. Very important. When you live in a very large metroplex, example Houston, you end up you're going to be showing houses where? All over Houston. So if, for example, Mr. Travis, if you lived hypothetically in Cyprus and you've got a client that wants to look at a house in Pearland, how long is that commute for you, sir? Not long. It's a very long drive, isn't it? And the closing has to occur where? Know where the property is located, which would be in the area. Yeah, I'm sorry. So in that situation is, Mr. Stahl goes down, he shows a property to say Mr. Keith. He goes down, shows Mr. Prop or him property in uh, Pearland. Mr. Keith loves the property. He wants to put an offer in it. Guess what? Mr. Travis must end up. He's got to be there for inspections. He's got to be there for all of the stuff. But sometimes we get lazy agents. And say, for example, not calling Travis lazy, but I'm just saying, let's say Mr. Travis here wanted to end up, he wanted to be lazy that day. He, he wanted to go out of town, go party with Miss Linda. And so, 
he wanted to go out partying with Miss Linda. That's my invitation. Uh, yeah, we left you, just left you high and dry, Mr. Stefan, unfortunately. I, and so they want to go out, have a few alcoholic beverages after a crazy awesome. week. And so Mr. Travis decides, well, I got to go to title and title's closer to me to receive the contract. So I'll just leave the options check at title and Mr. Grossman can come over and, and sign it, pick it up. Okay. That right there can never happen. Now, has it happened before? Yes. Happens. But pursuant to this, and if you want to stay here in real life, it's not supposed to. Have I done it? Yes, I've done it before. We've all done it. I guarantee you, you talk to most real estate agents, they've done it at some point. They were going out of town and they could not get it done and they had to figure something out. Happens. Okay. But the key thing is legally, options money should never be delivered to a third party. And another thing here, if it is, Say, for example, that Steph and I come up, and I'm Travis, and I give you the, the title, and I say, can you hold this? Uh, you know, Mr. Keith, the agent, is going to come over here. Mr. Eugene, the agent, is going to come over and receive it. It's fine at some point to do that as long as Mr. Eugene or Mr. Keith, whoever it is, is coming over to sign that moment. So they're on their way. Okay? It is never, never acceptable, never acceptable. For you to walk into title and say, hey, Mr. Grossman, here is the contract and the earnest money and the options check. Can you receive all those for me? And then when you see Mr. Keith come in, give him the options check. Title cannot receive options monies. Ever. Ever. Even if, even if Say Keith is the agent. Keith tells Linda and title company, Linda, it's fine. You can sign on my behalf. No. No. Does not count. It has to be done by those individuals that ended up that have actually gone in and that are licensed agents of that brokerage and only that brokerage. Okay. So option money should never be lit, delivered to a third party like the escrow agent. And all days in the contract are calendar days. So what does that mean, Mr. Eugene? We don't count weekends? You count weekends. I got to count weekends? Well, it says all days. It doesn't say all. You mean I got to actually count every day, Saturdays and Sundays, Sundays too? Yeah, Christmas. Christmas too? Christmas, Eve, yeah. Christmas, Christmas, Eve, Man. New Year's, all of them. So, again, yes, you have to count all days, no matter what. you got to count them. That's why when you're doing a contract, you got to be strategically thinking, what am I going to do here? <laughs> or if it's going to land on a day you're going out of town, you better have plans before you send that contract. You see what I'm saying? Okay? Yes? I'm also assuming it's a problem if you leave it at title because if I was going in as a buying agent, mm -hmm. I decided to leave option money and title so that way Stephen can come pick it up. He's the seller's agent. Huh? And he doesn't come within the three days, then I'm the one that's a default of not giving it to him that's as correct. opposed to him not coming to pick it up. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. Because you dropped it at a place that is not a designated place for him to come get it at. Okay. The worst point is this. What happens if you did go get it to Linda? And Linda loses it. Whoops. Linda lost it. And because she lost it, Mr. Grossman comes in and says, where's the check? And Miss Linda says, uh, uh, Travis never gave me one. Me and Stephen went on to point. Yeah. Left check. I so what happens in that situation? <laughs> what happens here? Is now you're in that point that now it's a it's it's a problem. It is that's why I always tell people, especially going back to Houston, like I said, I have done transaction guys and gals in Houston many times myself. I'm here in Bryan College Station, and I've had transactions where the other agent. So we're showing houses a house in Cypress, 
but a contract in Cyprus. But the agent that is the listing agent is way down in Galveston. And I'm in College Station. Guess what? I'm going to have to do a trip trip where? I'm going to have to do a trip to Galveston to just have them sign a form. Just to give them $100. You actually had that happen. Yes, I've had it happen multiple times. I've had it happen in, in Austin. I had to go to Marble Falls, which is three hours away. Okay. So in these situations is, guys and gals, you've got to make certain that you're aware that you cannot, conveniency is not your friend in this situation. Okay. Now, option money, of course, is never refundable. However, it can be credited to the buyer at closing if the parties agree. And, of course, there's a checkbox in paragraph 23 for it. This is the biggest one here, consulting an attorney. If the parties to the contract have legal questions or concerns, they must be advised to consult an attorney before signing the contract. It's already in there. It's in the paragraph. Okay. Having an attorney is optional for the parties, but paragraph 24 gives a place to list their attorney's information if they have one. If they have one, they got a spot for them. Okay. Signatures at effective date. All of the parties should sign the contract at the bottom of page eight of the contract. This completes the agreements when all parties have signed. The licensee who obtains the final signature or the final initial is the one responsible for completing the, what Ms. Linda? Executed effective date above the party signature. Why is that important, Ms. Linda? Because that uh, speaks volume. What's so important about the, the effective date, Mr. Stahl? Everything basically yeah. is based off of that. Every, the auction period, is the, I mean, everything based off that effective date. Mm -hmm. So if we leave that blank, then we really even have contractual agreement. No. Nope. Nope. Not really. And the I contract sure never started yet. That's right. And I surely will be calling that. And if you're see. with my firm, Miss Linda will be calling you. She'll be calling you. She has. She will call you and call you and I, call I, you. I forgot it once and never, uh, never again will you. Never probably. again. But the key thing is, is yes, it's not, it's not so much the fact that, like I said, people are being hard or anything. It's just the fact you got to have some dates to run off of. Okay, and normally title will catch it most of the time when you're filing. Title will jump straight to that. If it's not filled out, they'll catch it. But uh, but most of the time is you want to kind of catch that before you go to title because you don't want to be the, the known agent that never fills out the execution date. Okay. Uh, now four things must happen to have an effective date. Okay, so before that date can be filled in, that Miss Linda loves to get filled in, the offer must be in writing. Okay, the offer has been signed by all parties and all changes have been initialed. So here's the thing, if I send a contract to Mr. Grossman and we're changing just one little thing in it and his client's initial, he cannot in that situation, once his client's initial fill in the date and send it back for my clients to initial. It is, he sends it back to me, I get my clients to initial the final change and then I put the date in. So it's the person that's doing the last change. Okay. The parties have complete agreement on all portions of the contract and nothing is still being debated or negotiated. Did you hear me there? Nothing is still being debated or negotiated. If you are, if you got a signed contract and you are still talking about stuff, does not matter. If I send a contract to Stefan, he gets his client to initial it, and I come back, and in between that little maybe hour window, my client's now like, yeah, we're not going to do that. It's not technically signed yet. Okay? You have to make certain that you end up. Another little kind of a side note real quick on this. This is just an FYI for everybody. 
if I send a contract, Mr. Grossman, to you, so I so you sent a contract to me, my buy or my sellers have reviewed it. They have X through a few things. We've sent it back to you for your client to go in. So we filled out, you know, like the notices and I put my client's email and all. I send it back to you for your clients to initial and all to send back to me. You never, even though you see their email addresses, you never send it to your client to initial and then send it to the, the agent's clients to initial. I had that happen before where I sent an offer back. I did not put my client's information. I do my standard thing with admin at noblesrealtygrp.com. Put that out there. And sure freaking enough, they sent the client, her client sign and it went and it said, hi, Mr. So-and-so. And they had thought that that was his email and sent it thinking he was going to sign it and I didn't get it. Okay. You have your client sign, you send it back to the agent. The agent will then get it signed. Okay. You never cross those paths. Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm, I'm sitting here and... And I understand that process there, okay? Yes. But I just don't understand why before those, uh, you have to have a pre-approval letter. Why wouldn't they put up at the top that you would have like a, make sure that your client has been pre-approved. Pre-approved is, is not an element of a contract. Okay. So, yeah, you don't have to. Okay. Not, it's, it's, it's best practices, but not a element of a contract. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. So a lot of agents and even if you look on the MLS at a lot of houses, they will say that the clients have to be pre-approved before they even look at an offer. Yep. Just because it's a headache if they don't, but it's not necessarily required. Pre-approval is kind of like what I call the gatekeeper. If in a situation, say for example, that I'm listing Mr. Jacob's house and it's $2 million, Mr. Jacob does not want just any Tom, Dick, and Harry walking around in his house. Right. He don't want anybody walking in that house. Mr. Jacob wants pre-approved serious buyers only walking in his house. So I will put in the MLS, prior to showing, please submit proof of funds or pre-approval letters to the listing agent for review before scheduling a showing. Okay. And what happens there is Mr. Jacob, I won't bug him at all until I end up having those those documents in my hand. You see what I'm saying? I, I just was, I understand what you Yes, ma'am. But no, it's more of a gatekeeping process <laughs> than an element of the contract. Okay. Okay. Now the parties have complete agreement on all portions of the contract. Again, nothing is still being debated or negotiated. And the fact that you have the written signed agreement now has been communicated. That's another thing. It has to be communicated to the other party or the other party's agent by some means. Now, you once that happens, now you'll have an effective date, so you would stop now and then fill it in. Okay? So once those four things are done, then you can fill it in. Now, page nine of the contract is primarily just for information only. Strictly for, or for information only. There's nothing here as an agreement to anything. It's just notices. Okay. Now, an amendment, we talked about this earlier, and if you want to highlight it again, highlight the first two, five, yeah, five letters there of amendment, which says what, Miss Linda? Amend. And what does the word amend mean, Miss Nobles? To change. to change something. So once a contract has been finalized, so after an effective date has been put in, the original document, you can no longer go back and now scratch out the initial stuff. Okay? Once that thing has been effective date's there, you can no longer change it. You're now under contract. So any changes after that date must be done with an amendment. And if there is not an amendment done, then it still stays the same values of what there already is. Okay, give me just a second. For those of you online, give me a minute so I can get set up. We're going to talk about a, uh, we're actually going to go through a contract real quick. So give me just a second, please. Real quick, Justin. Uh
Okay, so now that we've got that there, let's go right here. Okay, everybody see that out there? Yes, good. Everybody can see where we're at. So when you're completing a contract, we're actually going to go through it. I'm going to kind of show you just a basic contract in regards to just kind of more of a template purpose is what we're going to try to do. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through here this evening, and I'm just going to kind of fill a contract out um, off of a hypothetical situation. Okay. Now I will tell everybody, this is going to actually end up, this is going to be what you're going to be doing most likely the last day of class. Okay, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. You're going to fill out a contract. Okay, so I'm going to step us through one. I'll give a hypothetical here. Now, say for example, that in this situation, that um, let's just say here that Mr. Travis is ending up, he's selling his property. Okay, Mr. Travis is selling his property, and in this situation, he's going to sell it to Mr. Stephen Grossman. Okay, now when going through this, Mr. Grossman is going to be the one that's purchasing the property. So Mr. Grossman is the one that's actually drafting this contract. Mr. Stahl has no idea of what's going on, okay, because this is completely an offer, is what this is. So what happens here in this situation is Mr. Stahl don't know what's going on. We're just drafting a contract. So Mr. Grossman is going to write this contract in whose favor, Mr. Keith? Whose favor, if he's writing it, whose favor is he going to write this contract in? His. He is, exactly. So he's going to write this contract in his favor. Okay. So what's going to happen is we're just going to pick a property here. Let's just actually go through this. So we're going to go to Braz's CAD. Okay. And we're just going to come here to property search. And I'm just going to see. Um, 13, 12. Uh, you, you can do one of my old houses. Yeah. What's one of your old houses? Uh, 20. 2012 Esther Street. S like that? Yeah. Okay, we don't put street, remember. I think so let's it was put 20. it in here. I think that was it. No, no, nope. that wasn't it. <laughs> let's just do this. It's a long time ago. Let's just do this. Let's just do Esther and see what comes up. Wow. All right, there's a bunch of them, guys and gals. So we're just gonna pick the first one, just the easiest one. So we're gonna say this was his property. And what's going to happen is we're looking for the legal description. Okay. So we're going to go over here. We're going to say that this is Mr. Grossman's property, 604 Esther Boulevard. But you'll see right here is legal description. So what we're going to do is we need our lot number. So our lot number is seven. Our lot number is one. So we'll go back here. We're going to go to lot seven, lock one. And then you're going to take all of the rest of this stuff to there, you already did lock and block, you're going to copy it and you're going to put it over here. Okay. Now it is in, it's located in Bryan, I'm sorry, yes, Bryan County of Brazos. And this is where you're going to put the normal address. Do you see what I'm saying? Here? Okay. So you're going to put Esther Boulevard and you're going to say Bryan, Texas. 77802. Now, if you'll notice right here, it normally just says all you got to do is put address and zip code. You can. I always just like to spell it out, but you don't have to. Okay. So now we have dictated that our parties are between Travis Stahl, Grossman, Stephen Grossman, the land, the lot, the legal description. Remember, the land only is located here. Here are our improvements. The accessories, but Mr. Grossman loves the fireplace screen that he ended up, he made himself. Okay. Or Mr. That was Mr. Stab, Travis, I'm sorry, Mr. Travis. C, isn't it? Huh? Is that fireplace screen already in C? It is in C, but Mr. Oh, the Mr. Seller. The yeah. seller has put in the MLS for saying hypothetically, Mr. Travis, you put in there. That you did not want the fireplace screen oh, to gotcha. transfer. 
Hey, I, I mixed that for a minute. But yeah, you're good. Mr. Travis ended up, does not want the fireplace screen to transfer. I really okay. like my fireplace screen. That's right. I think, I think you need to take the fireplace mm -hmm. logs. So too. now, in this situation, now we're going to calculate paragraph three. Sure. Okay. Now, Mr. Grossman is that. noticing on here that the assessed value for this property is $140,000 and or 140607 Okay. Now, this is a hypothetical. Y'all listen for a minute because it's very key here. What happens here is a lot of people, like, you'll get this question. I think Mr. Stahl, you even had got this question. Well, why in the world is Mr. Stahl selling his property for two hundred thousand dollars when it's assessed at 140. Mr. Stahl, what do you tell your client? We're having other stuff done to it where sometimes the assessed value isn't actually the full value of the whole property. Here you're you're on task there. The main thing I tell my client is this. How many of you are like for example, I'll play this out, okay? Say that Mr. Grossman is the buyer of your house. So I'd say, Mr. Grossman, have you ever purchased a car before? Yes. I have. Okay. When you went down to the county, the tax assessor's office, did you walk in there and did you write down, I paid $28,000 for my car? Did you willingly put that down? No. What do you want to put down? I, I got it for $1.50. Or I got it for one thousand dollars. Why in the world, Mr. Grossman, would you do that? I don't know, because your tax rate's going to be lower. Your tax rate's going to be way down. Okay. So Mr. Grossman goes over, and Mr. Grossman's going to do what? He's going to give a low price. So what do you think this person did, Mr. Grossman, or I mean, Mr. Travis, on this one? What did he do here? He's going to put the lowest value on his house, right, Mr. Travis? Yes, because he doesn't want to pay a ton of taxes. Okay. But when he sells it, he knows what his property's worth. He knows it's worth 200, but he's going to only show in the tax records it's only worth 140. That's why I tell people a lot of times if you see a property listed at 145 and it's at 140, that property most likely is going to be closer to maybe 180 to 200,000 and whoever's listing it doesn't know what they're doing. Okay. So again, if you would see this and you want to explain that. So Mr. Grossman though, in this situation, Mr. Stahl has it listed for $200,000. Mr. Stahl, however, is he does not track or Stefan does not want to offer 200,000 to Mr. Stahl. He wants to only offer $180,000. Okay. Now, how you do this, I'm going to bring this calculator up here. Okay. So he wants to offer $180,000. Now, since this is Mr. Grossman's primary residence, he only has to put down how much down? Three and a half percent. Three and a half percent. So you take multiply 0 0.35. Sorry, one more zero. Nope, not gonna work. Just gonna do it this way because it's acting up. Like this. And it's sixty three hundred dollars. So sixty three hundred dollars is gonna go right there. Okay. Now we got to bring that calculator back up. He's getting financing for the remainder. So he's getting financing for $173,700, which then if you're in a platform, it would normally calculated it. It would have popped up $180,000, which is right there. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, we have $180,000 there. Now, one thing before we jump paragraph three, we have to check box that third party financing because he's getting financing. If this was blank, if B was blank, then all of these boxes in here need to stay blank. Does that make sense? So, if B's blank, there should not be any checks here, and the total amount should be on line A and line C. It's a cash offer. Okay. 
Now, Mr. Grossman is a real estate agent and he's also the principal. So in this situation is buyer is a licensed real estate. Well, that's another thing I don't like about typing on here because it doesn't keep going through like normal is a licensed real estate agent. Okay, he has to disclose that. Then we come down here to earnest money and what did we say yesterday? Mr. Stahl, yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. So one of the transactions I did, the buyer was a licensed real estate agent in Nevada. Uh -huh. I'm assuming you don't have to specify that because it's not Trek. That's correct. Okay. If they are licensed real estate agent in Texas, they have to disclose. If they are not licensed in the state, they do not have to disclose. Okay. Very good question. And that's where, you, if you're kin to that person. If you're kin to them, have business interest, whatever, that's where paragraph four is for. Okay. And it says only spouse, parent, or child, but I'm assuming if it's, it's like, just best to disclose. I say it's best to do it no matter what. Yes. Okay. You don't have to, but it's best to just put it out there. Yeah. So nobody can come back and say you're trying to be crooked or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Now, what do we say the best idea for earnest money should be down? 1%. 1%. Mr. Grossman, what's 1% of $180,000? Uh, 1800 $1,800. And so 1%, he's using university title company. And now what you do is you come over here to university title company, you put it in here, and you find their address. Okay? You copy it. You put that address right there. And in this situation, we're not going to end up giving any additional funds. So I'm filling that out. We're doing just a flat $1,800, okay? Now, under title policy, what would be a use for the extra earnest money as far as just like, if you can't put it all down at once because you need the next, whatever, you could, you could separate it out or the, yes. Or what happens a lot of times when that second card is used is if it's an extremely long option period. So say that they're doing a 30 day option period for due diligence or they need environmental assessments. So they need 60 days. So what they end up doing is you pay 1800 now and after option ends, you're going to put another 1800 showing that you're still serious in purchasing the property. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But yes, and it could be different ways. There's a lot of different ways to be used, but that's normally the, the normal. Okay. okay. All right. Now, in title policy, the standard is the seller pays for it because the seller's the one that basically it's benefiting in this situation. And it's going to be, again, university title company. It's normally the same people here. Now, this right here, you could say, Say, for example, that I wanted Colton Ledbetter to end up being the escrow agent. So I'm going to say university title, but I only want to deal with Colton. Okay. I can dictate who I want to deal with at the title company. I can pick who I want to give. Okay. But I'm going to say something. If you do that, say that I say that Stefan is writing this contract and he's getting a kickback from Colton for using him because he gets a certain amount of money. That is illegal. You cannot get any kickbacks from the person that you're asking to be escrow. This person is supposed to be a neutral person, okay? So that's an example that you could put there. But if it's someone you worked before, like worked with before, then you yeah. might. If, if yeah. it's somebody you just have a good working relationship with, put them in there. So do you have to put Colton uh, name down? No. So you'll see here, just title company. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking my agent to be Colton. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So I scroll on down here. Another <laughs> thing that a lot of people forget is they forget to fill out the property address up here at the top. What you're supposed to end up doing is you're supposed to copy this and put the property address on each page. But the platform, might and the platform would normally do it for you. This one's not going to, okay? Now, of course, we're back down here to this boundaries. Again, in common practice, how we do things here, 
What I would do in a normal practice is I would have checked that box and I would have put the seller. But in reality, what's going to end up happening is it's going to come back to the buyer. But again, we're writing this contract in whose favor? Stephens, because Stephens writing it up. Okay. We stroll down to survey. Mr. Travis has not provided us a survey. So we are asking five days that he submits the survey to. Okay. If it doesn't, again, I'm writing this contract in my favor, or in Stephen's favor, so I'm going to put seller. Okay. Now what's going to happen? When I send this over to Travis, what's Travis going to come back on? This one? Nope, we're not buying it. It's on the buyer. And that's only how it ends up all the time. Okay. Right here in objections, this is the point that we're asking if there's anything that does not allow me to live in the property, that's why I'm putting residential and or rental usage. Okay, it says that if there's anything in the deed where I cannot rent or live in it, I want to know and I want to have at least 10 to 20 days out. Again, I'm shooting high because the fact is I want to shoot high, it's probably most likely going to come back with this number. Okay, so that kind Can of that shows number you. change. It's going to, it all is negotiable. Again, if I was writing this contract and I'm sending it to Travis, I'm going to put 20. He's going to come back and most likely agree to 10. Okay, but again, it's negotiable. I'm just kind of showing you this as hypotheticals. In this hypothetical, is this in an HOA? We're going to say for this situation, it is not. Okay, again, we need to put our property address here. Scroll down. All of these are just notices. Every one of those are notices. I just skipped something. Or did I skip? Address. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. That's a good catch. Okay. Now, now we end up, we're going to say that Mr. Stahl did not give us notice. So we want five days. He did not give us seller's disclosure notice. Okay. And like I said yesterday, we're accepting the property as is. Okay. Scroll on down. Press. Now this is that home warranty. Now, of course, Mr. Grossman wants the best of the best home warranty. So he's going to put $700. Okay. That's what he's going to put. He's going to put his closing for February 12, 2021, okay? Possession, because we're not going into a lot tonight because we're running out of time. It's gonna say upon funding and closing. And special provisions, of course, we said already, there should always be NA, unless there's something in a unique situation. And looky here, paragraph 12. Stefan really wants to put the screws to Mr. to Mr. Stahl. So he puts five thousand dollars in here. Okay. And if you notice, where is this nice little paragraph 12 located? On what part of the page? Really, really, very bottom. The very bottom. It's hiding down there. Okay. So Mr. Grossman puts five thousand dollars in there. Scroll on down, put our address. Keep on going. These are your notices. Uh, uh, there you go there. Thank you. Now, what did we say here? Travis. Care of buyer. Well, in this situation, he's caring for himself. Okay. But you normally would put your name. So the agent name would normally go there. Care of buyer. And then we're just going to use the office information. And the reason we're doing the office information is because Ms. Nobles loves to talk to everybody. So y'all call her anytime you want. Right, Ms. Nobles, 24-7. Oh, yeah. But no, so you're going to fill this out. Again, we don't know Travis's information, so we're going to leave it blank. Because remember, we're filling this out without knowing who the heck it is. Okay. Now on 22, what happens is that you're going to end up, remember, we checked third-party financing. It is not any seller financing. There is no mandatory membership. 
We're not asking for a temporary lease or a loan assumption. There is no sale of other property. There is no reservation of oil. There's no backup, coastal area, hydrotic or hydrostatic testing. We are gonna want this box, which is the addendum, and we'll talk about that in another class. We're not doing that tonight. The environmental assessment we don't have. There is no temporary lease. There is no sell, short sell. There is no property located of a seawall or seaward of the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Yes. There is, yes. in this situation, let's go back here. Let's check our date if they have it in this one. And look at when this house was built. 1957. And if it's 1950, what was the date? On or before what date? 1978. What was the date though? January 1st, 1978. We have to include that addendum. Okay. And one other one that they have yet to steal, and I still don't know why they don't put it in there, is the non realty items addendum. Okay. We scroll on down, put our address. Here's our termination $100 for 10 days. It will be credited. Mr. Grossman does not need an attorney. And of course, the program normally, if you have a program would let me type Mr. Grossman's name underneath the word buyer. And again, put in this stuff. And because Mr. Grossman is a real estate agent, we would fill in all of this stuff with his information and his broker. I'm not gonna go through all of that, okay? But the key part down here is this one. If you're, still, if you're sleeping right now, you might want to wake up, okay? Because this is extremely important, okay? If you do not put a number in that blank, you are entitled to how much commission? Zero. Zero. And this only applies if you are the other broker. If you're the listing broker, you're entitled to your percentage that's in the listing agreement. But if you're the other broker, you've got to put your percentage in there. If you don't, you're entitled to not one penny and you don't get any money. Okay, very important there. The remainder of this is the receiving of the contract. Okay, the last page. But you don't do anything on that page until all parties have ended up they have signed up here and it has been executed okay now mr grossman after he fills this out he's going to send it to mr stall and if y'all were all in the classroom i'd actually have this printed out and i would kind of act it out to y'all but what would happen is is mr grossman would take this and email it to Mr. Stahl after he has signed, Mr. Grossman has to sign. So Mr. Grossman has signed the contract. He has sent it to Mr. Stahl. Mr. Stahl in that situation would now go through the contract and look, okay? Now, Mr. Grossman in this, or Mr. Stahl in this situation, so far, I'm gonna ask you, let's play this out real quick, Mr. Stahl. Parties, do you agree with, okay with paragraph one? Yes, I'm good. You agree with paragraph two? Yep. Okay. Are you okay with paragraph three? What? Like my two hundred thousand? Well, he's giving you one hundred eighty. But I want two hundred. So you want two hundred? So yeah, you want to counter him? So he wants to counter. So what would have happened is he wanted two hundred thousand. So what would happen is you do not redraft this whole contract. In the platform, you would actually have used, and I can't do it on here because I don't have the the platform but you would actually highlight that number and put X's over it and put over here 200,000 and recalculate these numbers. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's how you would have done it. Okay. And the, and the parties would have to initial the changes, right? The parties have to initial anything that Travis marks through. Okay. Now, if Travis didn't have, say Travis is in a rush, he doesn't have time to get on a computer and do all this. Travis can just mark through it, put 200,000, run all the numbers, and write it neat. That's fine. He, he can do that. Yeah. No whiteout. You never whiteout. You just mark through it and, and write the stuff. 
Mr. Travis, are you okay with four? Yep. Number five, are you okay with number five? Yep. Are you sure about that? Well, I want two. I want two thousand. You yeah. want two thousand yeah. because you just went up on your price. So this amount right here needs to jump to two. Okay. So we mark through that. We put two thousand dollars. Okay. Are you okay with the title companies in this situation? Yeah, we're fine with it. Okay, but sometimes that can be an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see here. Are you okay with this statement on number eight that you will pay for the shortages of area? No, nope. I want the fire. Paper. You want the fire. So you would mark through that, check this one in initials. Okay. Title or the survey. Are you good with this part? I want it to be turn on this buyer. So, so you good with this yeah, one? Yeah, that now. Okay, good. Are you good with this part on D? Yep. Okay, it's fine with that. And we said there's no mandatory association, so we're good there. Okay, keep on going. Are you good with B2 here, sir? On the seller's disclosure. You want to give him an extra seven day option for no. free. No, so what should you fill out when you send this back to him with the counter? You should complete the seller's disclosure, yeah. right? Yeah. So Mr. Stahl <laughs> should complete the seller's disclosure before I send that back. And send and yep, before you do it. So when you send it all back with your counter, seller's disclosure needs to go back. And, and when you do that, time. you would basically come in here. X through that, X through that, check box one and initial both of those spots. Okay. We're okay with the buyers accepting it as is. Are you good with paying $700 for him a home warranty? No. No. How much you going to give him? 600 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever. Yeah. Again, mark through it, put 500 initial. Okay. But I will say, while in real life you want to counter, it's actually best to give them what they want here because if something goes wrong, you gave them the highest thing that's out there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. But again, we're just playing hypothetical. Are you good with this closing date? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good with that. Are you good with closing and funding that he takes possession? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Nothing here. How do you feel about this 5,000 that he won? That's crazy. That's crazy? Yeah. All right, because if we leave that five thousand, how much are you actually getting, Mr. Stall? If well, you're at two hundred, right I'm right. Well, yeah, one ninety-five. So you'd only get one ninety-five, and you're wanting two hundred. Mm -hmm. So in here, you'd mark through that initial and leave it blank. Okay. Would you put if you put like a zero? Yeah, you can put zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll keep the space. No, I want. We're gonna get to that in a second. So we go on down. Everything still just notices. This is where you would fill in your information. So Travis would fill his in. He would look at these addendums. He'd say, okay, I'm good yeah. with those. All right. He would look at these amendments. Are you good with those terms? $100 for 10 days? Sure. Okay. And then would he sign? My question now, Miss Linda, would Travis sign now? No. no. He, oh, it's changed. He's yeah. been changed. Yeah, he has Since it's been it changed, in. he now would stop here and, send, and it send it back to Stephen right. with, the, yeah. with the seller's yeah. disclosure. Yeah. At that point, Stephen so, can do what? Counter <laughs> he can counter or he can decline. Accept, decline. Yeah. There's three yeah. options yeah. accept, counter, decline. Right. Okay, so what he can do. If he accepts, now most of the time when you send an initial offer, Travis is going to keep it back, so go back and forth, back and forth, until they eventually get to it. But whose signature stays on the document the entire time? The buyer. Mm -hmm. So what if Stefan ends up, he's looking at other properties while he's still negotiating? Should he send another contract out? Heck no. No. If you're negotiating, you do not allow your client to go and send a contract down at all if they're in negotiations. Because what happens is if they're back and forth, bouncing, 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 and then Stefan just happens to send one to you, Miss Linda, and you like, oh yeah, I accept. And then Travis, accept. 
Now guess what? You're buying two houses. You're buying two houses. Okay. You have to in this situation, you gotta make certain your client stays with one house. Okay. Now, is there any questions? That's just basically it. We're not going to the amendments because we're actually going to talk Monday about the amendments. So I'm not going into those. Addendums, I'm sorry, addendums. We're going to talk about those on Monday. Is there any questions over what we just did tonight? Anybody here in the classroom? No. Anybody online have any questions on what we just covered? No. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So with that being said, that basically covers what we're going to cover for this evening. So let me go ahead and stop the recording.